Again, uh, welcome everyone and uh, welcome to our first speaker. Uh, Casey Manahan is our first speaker and is a senior attorney at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. Casey joined DRN in 2020 and her work focuses on challenges to natural gas infrastructure, federal permitting, both federal and state environmental laws and land use law. Prior to joining the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, Manahan practiced environmental law in a private boutique firm in New Jersey, and Casey also served as a judicial clerk in the, to the Honorable Robert Gilson in the Superior Court of New Jersey Appellate Division. Casey graduated magna cum laude from Lewis and Clark Law School in Portland, Oregon, with a certificate in environmental, natural resources, and energy law. She obtained her Bachelor of Arts in Media and Communication from Ursinus College in Collegeville, Pennsylvania, um, there in the Schuylkill watershed, and she is licensed to practice law in both New Jersey and Pennsylvania. So Casey, welcome, um, and uh, we will switch from this general slide uh, and allow you to get your slides up and running. Thank you so much, Eric. That was a big introduction. Let me uh, <laughs> let me share my slides. Okay, can everyone see? Yep, they look good. Thank you. So my presentation today is going to be about the basics of the Clean Water Act, um, some, some of the background and the basic structure and goals of the Clean Water Act. So the history of today's Clean Water Act, uh, prior, to, prior to the enactment of federal environmental statutes, Clean, uh, clean water and pollution was seen more of a state's uh, issue. So states had their own laws, regulations about, um, you know, what, what could be discharged into, into streams and rivers and what types of uh, activities were prohibited. And, you know, a lot of times this was um, compared to today, what we are used to today, it seems like minor stuff. You know, I, I remember reading some, some old laws about you can't have your dead animals in the stream or something like that. Um, and, or, you know, the discharge of, of um, wastewater from your, from your personal uh, sewage facilities. But, you know, since, since World War II, um, when our society became heavily industrialized and a lot of new chemicals and, and new types of industries were created, um, the federal government began to recognize that this is a nationwide problem and it's affecting the entire country. And so in 1948, the first Federal Water Pollution Control Act was enacted. Um, in 1970, uh, the, the EPA was created and uh, in the early, well, throughout the 1970s, but especially in the early 1970s was when uh, a lot of the major federal environmental laws that we're familiar with, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, um, were created and you know throughout the 70s there was the endangered species act um the uh uh resource and recovery act um <clears throat> but the first the first one was clean clean air act in 1970 the us epa was created at that time as well and then in 1972 the federal water pollution control act was significantly amended and that's what created the clean water act that we know today um, there were also additional amendments in 1977, um, and here I have a photo of Senator Edmund Muskie, and he was he was very instrumental in a lot of these major laws um, and getting them passed. And you can see on his podium there. Well, maybe you can't see; it's very small, but it says Earth Week, April 16th to 20 to 22nd. So it looks like he was speaking at an Earth Week event. So in Section 101 of the Clean Water Act, that, that's where Congress states their goals. Um, and their objective was to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. One of the first goals was to eliminate the discharge of pollutants by 1985, so completely eliminate all, all discharges. Um, and there was also a major goal of achieving, where attainable, the water quality, which provides for the protection and propagation of fish, shellfish, and wildlife, and provides for the recreation provides for recreation in and on the water by 1983. And this is known as the fishable swimmable goal. Uh, the way that the Clean Water Act is implemented is through cooperative federalism. 
And what that means is that the federal government and the states work together to to implement and enforce the Clean Water Act um, and as tribes as well. Uh, there are some tribes in the United States that are that are given what is called treatment as states uh, under the Clean Water Act, which means that they have you know the sufficient resources and laws to um, actually help implement the Clean Water Act in their in their respective territories. Um, so here's some examples of uh, different roles that the states and tribes versus the federal government play. Um, states and tribes will set water quality standards. Uh, if they are authorized to, to do so, they can issue permits under the under the two major permitting programs of the Clean Water Act, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, they can enact their own laws and regulations that control non-source, non-point source pollution. Um, non-point source pollution, just a little preview, we'll talk about it a little more as well, is um, I, I guess the most traditional form that you can think of is runoff, you know, runoff from, from parking lots, from uh, from agricultural operations, things like that into, into a stream. Um, well, the federal government, they will set effluent guidelines, which uh, for industrial categories based on the performance of treatment and control technologies. And so those effluent guidelines are used to help um, the permit, the permit authors draft the permits and what are the requirements um, for a discharger. And they also uh, review the state and tribal water quality standards. So once once those water quality standards are set, the federal government kind of has a monitoring role over those water quality standards to make sure that the goals of the Clean Water Act are being met. Um, and they also review applications from states and tribes to be authorized to implement the Clean Water Act permitting programs. Um, and I, they have you know continuing oversight over that implementation. So section 301 of the Clean Water Act, this is this is kind of the jurisdictional provision that um, that tells you what is prohibited under federal law and how far does the Clean Water Act really reach. Um, and it's very it seems like a simple sentence, but it says the discharge of any pollutant by any person shall be unlawful. And so the definitions of the, the words in that sentence get more and more complicated. So a discharge is any addition of any pollutant to navigable waters from any point source. Um, a pollutant can be pretty much anything other than the same water itself. It could even be water from a different water body that has, you know, different a different make makeup of uh, chemicals or background contamination or things like that. Um, navigable waters are also known as the waters of the United States. You might have heard that phrase. Um, it's a very controversial regulatory definition that is defined jointly by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and both those federal agencies have major roles in implementing the Clean Water Act. The uh, EPA has the primary role, but the Army Corps has a very important role as well. Um, and a point source is, the, the image on the right is the classic example of a point source. Any discernible, confined, and discrete conveyance. Um, so it could be a pipe, it could be a channel leading towards um, a surface water. Uh, it could be, you know, you could back up a truck and, and dump something into a stream and that would be a point source. Um, so those are the definitions that make up the federal jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act. This is just a, a brief slide on the waters of the United States. Uh, just because it's it's so controversial and it's very um, a current topic in in the legal world, uh, so this is defines the you know the the physical and geographical reach of the federal government's jurisdiction and and what waters they can regulate. Um, so there have been several rounds of of rules promulgated uh, that define waters of the United States. They've been rescinded uh, and they've been challenged in court and courts have vacated some of them. So for most recent examples were in 2015, um, the Obama administration published a rule. Um, that rule was rescinded by the Trump administration and replaced with a different rule that somewhat restricted the, the scope of waters 
that were subject to the Clean Water Act. And then that rule has been thrown out by the courts. So technically, they are back to a an older definition, pre-2015 definition. And um, that definition has been interpreted by the Supreme Court uh, in, in the case you might have heard of called Rapanos. Um, so they, they, there's guidance out there based on the Rapanos case. Um, and the below the next two points here are are what they what the EPA and the core have decided Rapanos means uh, for their jurisdiction. So they will assert jurisdiction over traditional navigable waters, also known as I'm just abbreviating it as TNW in this slide for for uh, you know saving some space. But um, those are you know typically waters that you can actually navigate a boat on. Um, wetlands adjacent to tradi traditional navigable waters. And uh, adjacency is also a term that has been debated that's currently um, just recently in an oral argument before the Supreme Court. The case uh, is known as uh, Sackett, the Sackets. Um, they are uh, some folks who filled in a wetland. And the question is whether it was adjacent uh, to, a, to a stream. Um, so adjacency it doesn't mean directly abutting, as you'll see. There's a another term there that says directly abutting. Um, Non-navigable tributaries of traditional navigable waters that are relatively permanent, meaning they're they're flowing through most throughout most of the year. Uh, they're not dried up for for long extended periods of time. Um, and wetlands that directly abut such tributaries. Um, and then so those are ones that. You can just look at them, and if they meet that description, they are they are uh, regulated under the Clean Water Act. But the the EPA and the Corps will evalu evaluate the following on a case by case basis to determine if there is a quote unquote significant nexus to a traditional navigable water. Um, and that term significant nexus was what was used in the Rapanos case by uh, Justice Kennedy, um, <clears throat> and it, it basically uh, refers to a uh, Justice Kennedy referred back to. Let me just click click back here. Um, oh, the goals of the Clean Water Act: so chemical, physical, and biological integrity. So significant nexus has to do with the chemical, physical, and biological um, relationship between the body of water in question and the traditional navigable water. Um, so. These are some examples of, of water bodies that would need to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. So non-navigable tributaries that are not relatively permanent, wetlands adjacent to non-navigable tributaries that are not relatively permanent, wetlands adjacent to, but that do not directly abut a relatively permanent non-navigable tri tributary. And so when there's a question over uh, federal jurisdiction, there's uh, a process called a jurisdictional determination um, that the federal government will do uh, to help you determine, like if you have one of these water bodies on your property or if you're going to do something that may affect one of these water bodies, uh, you can request from the federal government a jurisdictional determination before you take any action to make sure that you won't be violating the Clean Water Act. So, Section 303 of the Clean Water Act governs water quality standards, which are really the, the backbone of the Clean Water Act and which uh, are the method by which uh, states and the federal government can measure the success of, of the Clean Water Act and its, and its implementation. So the states and tribes <coughs> are, so the, this first slide is uh, dedicated to uses, the concept of uses, because water quality standards are made up of both uses and criteria. Um, so states and tribes are responsible for identifying and designating the uses of water bodies. Um, <clears throat> and there's a legal presumption that the fishable, swimmable goal, um, as you remember from the goals of the Clean Water Act, can be attained, which can be rebutted by evidence in a use attainability analysis. So what that means is, um, you know, the, the federal government is assuming that all of the waters in a state or a tribal territory can become fishable, swimmable through implementation of the Clean Water Act. Uh, but if the tribe or the state does a use attainability analysis, which is um, 
a scientific process and it, it requires a lot of evidence um, and involves uh, involves the public as well, public input. And they determine we're not going to be able to achieve that um, even with you know all the tools that the Clean Water Act gives us, um, then that can you know rebut that legal presumption. Um, so the two types of uses are designated uses and existing uses. So existing uses, I'm gonna go backwards, but existing uses are the uses that are actually attained in a particular water body. So that means we, you know, the water uh, water quality is good enough that there can be propagation of fish or something like that. Um, designated uses are more of go more like goals. So uh, they may not may or may not yet be attained for a particular water body. Um, and on the right there, I have some example of uses. There's you know the traditional section uh, 101 uses, um, protection and propagation of fish and wildlife. Uh, there's primary contact recreation, uh, which means activities where you might ingest water like swimming. Uh, secondary contact recreation where you likely won't ingest water like canoeing or something like that. Um, <clears throat> and then there, you know, there's really not much of a uh, limit on the uses that a, a state or a tribe can identify, but here there's some examples. Uh, ceremonial uses is one of them, agricultural uses, public water supply for surface water, you know, like if there's a drinking water intake, but it can also include um, protection of surface water quality for the purpose of, you know, recharging groundwater if the surface water recharges uh, groundwater and that groundwater is then used for uh, public water supply. Um, industrial processes, so cooling water intake or hydropower generation, navigation. <clears throat> um, there's a there's a status of of water called an outstanding natural resource national resource water. Um, so that those are some examples of uses. And criteria are are essential to. Um, implementation of of those uses or the the practical uh, translation of those uses into into permits. Um, so they the states and tribes are also responsible for establishing these criteria to protect the uses, um, and those help to determine the applicable limitations in permits. So they're based on scientific data and expert judgment. They can be numeric or narrative. Uh, so they can ex be expressed using numbers like micrograms per liter or parts per million of whatever the substance is, <clears throat> or they can just describe the quality of water. Um, you know, say there can't be a sheen, there can be no sheen, oil sheens on the water. That would be a violation of a water quality standard, um, or or like floating debris or even odors. Um, And water quality standards also involve, or the when a state sets water quality standards, it must also have an anti-degradation policy, um, <clears throat> which means they, when there's a there's a point source or activity which would include non-point sources that would degrade water quality, um, this is how the state needs to the state needs to set a policy by which they will evaluate. Um, whether to allow that activity or point source to, to go forward. Um, so the protection of existing uses must be maintained. So if there's an existing use that has been achieved in a water, uh, the, the state or tribe cannot let the activity degrade the, the, the water body below the point where that existing use would no longer be attained. Um, the second tier is protection of high quality waters. And the third tier is protection of outstanding natural resource waters. Um, and in Pennsylvania, we have a category known as exceptional value, um, which includes a lot of different types of water bodies, but and and that includes outstanding natural resource waters. Um, and then there's also section 303D, which is part of also part of the section governing water quality standards. Uh, and that addresses impaired waters and TMDL, which stands for total maximum daily load. So 
Section 303D requires the states and tribes to identify um, those waters within its boundaries for which effluent limitations and permits are not stringent enough to implement any water quality standard ap applicable to such waters, aka impaired water bodies. Um, they, states and tribes are, are required to, or they're supposed to establish a total maximum daily load for these waters uh, and submit the TMDL to EPA for approval or if EPA does not approve the TMDL, they need EPA needs to establish its own TMDL for those waters. So a TMDL uh, is usually it's for a single um, pollutant uh, or a single you know water quality standard um, in a single water body. Uh, they can be combined. You can combine a couple of pollutants in in a single TMDL. Um, but what it essentially is is a calculation of um, the sum of the waste load allocations, which means uh, the amount of whatever the substance is, let's say, let's say it's um, like in the Delaware River, PCBs. Uh, so how many, what's the total amount of PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls? Um, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly because I don't have a science background, but that's how I read it. <laughs> um, the PCBs coming from point sources, the sum of the PCBs coming from non-point sources, such as like runoff or, or seepage from groundwater, um, and then whatever amount of PCBs is just naturally in the in the background, um, you know, level of contamination in the water, plus a margin of safety. And so this calculation, um, by identifying you know these different sources of the contaminant. Is, is supposed to allow the states to and tribes uh, or whoever the permitting authority is, because because sometimes the EPA is the permitting authority um, to kind of ratchet down the level of contamination and reduce, uh, get it to the point where it's not on the 303D list anymore. Um, it's a very time and cost intensive process. It takes a lot of, um, <clears throat> you know, research and, and uh, calculations and you know a lot of scientific effort and regulatory effort. Um, so it's often reserved for high profile or high priority impaired water bodies. And at the bottom there, I note that there's a TMDL for PCBs in the estuary. Um, and that has been de developed primarily by the Delaware River Basin Commission, uh, which has some uh, responsibility under the Clean Water Act um, as a interstate federal compact. And so this is, you know, some of the major permitting programs, you know, this is where I guess you could say the rubber meets the road. And uh, the major permitting program that we're probably most familiar with is the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. And if you remember, one of the goals of the Clean Water Act was to eliminate all discharge of pollutants by 1985. Obviously that didn't happen, um, <clears throat> but the NPDES program or NIPDES program uh, is very technology based. Um, and that's where those effluent guidelines come in from the EPA. It's based on the types of technologies that can be used for different industries um, that have you know, point source discharges and how advanced those technologies can be uh, and how feasible it is for these industries to use those technologies. And then those technologies can be implemented through a permit. Um, and so the permit is an exception to that. If you remember the, the th section 301 prohibition on discharging pollutants. So it's illegal to discharge any pollutant into a water of the United States, unless you have a permit. And this is one of the permits, um, types of permits then a uh, NIPTES permit. Uh, it's often implemented by the states and the tribes. Um, they include effluent limitations, which are the actual requirements of the of the permit. And they're usually based on both technology. You know, what's the what's the technology that's available um, to reduce the pollution, and also um, the limitations can be based on water quality. So, like in the example of the TMDL, uh, you can work backwards from that and say, like, if there's you know, this much, this allocation for uh, a waste load um, from point sources, then 
this this particular point source that we're permitting now can only discharge X amount. Um, and they can also, you know, these permits can also include some narrative limitations, like uh, like uh, I mentioned before with the water quality standards, um, such as you can't your discharge can't create an oil sheen or something like that. Um, NIPTES permits last for five years, uh, but as long as a permit holder applies for renewal within, I think it's 180 days before the expiration date, um, then they're in the clear that permit would continue to apply. Um, there are some some states where there's a major backlog um, where the state hasn't had a chance to review these these per these uh, renewal applications. And there are some I know you know from my experience when I was in law school in Oregon that Oregon had a major problem <clears throat> with I think they were calling them zombie permits that were like 20 years old or something like that. So obviously when a permit is that old, it's not it's no longer reflecting the technology that's available or possibly the quality of the water that is being discharged into. Um, another major type of permit under the Clean Water Act is a Section 404 permit. These are typically uh, issued by the US Army Corps of Engineers um, because this is kind of their traditional uh, bailiwick, which is dredging and uh, filling in waters and creating um, you know, new land where there wasn't land before in these major like engineering projects. Um, so the the trigger for a section 404, 404 permit versus a 402 permit is whether the discharge, the pollutant that's being discharged is a is dredged or fill material. So it's the category of pollutant. Um, dredged material includes redeposit, uh, other than incidental fallback. And you can see in this image uh, below that's that's a dredge. Um, not sure whether that would be considered incidental fallback. You can see <clears throat> all that goop, all that sediment kind of pouring back into the water. Um, but you know, sometimes that can be considered incidental fallback because it's not the purpose of they're not trying to discharge that goop into the river. They're actually trying to lift it out. But um, and fill material is whatever material is necessary for the construction of any structure in the water in a water of the United States. Um, most commonly, this happens in wetlands, right? Where where wetlands exist, but someone wants to um, develop, build a building, put a parking lot, something like that. So they fill in with dirt uh, and cover the wetland so that it's no longer, um, you know, the unstable. Uh, support that a wetland is. Um, so under the 404 program, the idea is that you can't discharge dredged or fill material if there's a practicable alternative that's less damaging to the aquatic environment. So there's an alternatives analysis built into this permitting program. Um, and some of you may be familiar with uh, the idea of alternatives analysis from the uh, National Environmental um, NEPA. <laughs> uh, NEPA it requires a, a an alternatives analysis as well. Um, and uh, the there is also no discharge of dredged or fill material if the nation's water would be significantly degraded. So even if you have uh, no practicable alternative, if the activity would significantly degrade the waters, you still can't get a permit. Um, <clears throat> Typical, as I said before, typical 404 discharge involves filling in a wetland. Um, these uh, discharges can be authorized either by an individual permit or a general permit. Um, individual permit is the traditional, you know, the person who wants to do the discharge applies to the agency with information about the project that they're uh, proposing to do that results in a discharge. Um, a general permit is typically generated by the agency. Uh, they look at a certain type of uh, activity that would violate the Clean Water Act, but it's such a, a small uh, activity that would be, you know, administratively burdensome for everyone who did this activity to, to apply uh, for an individual permit. So they'll look at something that has a small effect um, and then create a general permit. Uh, that would cover that. So as long as you meet the requirements in a general permit, you can be assured that you're covered, that it's not illegal, 
uh, there's a permit out there for you. Um, fewer states and tribes administer this program compared to the MPDES program, but some do. Um, and finally, the Section 401, which is not, it's not quite a permitting program, but um, it's very uh, important and it's very controversial at the moment. Um, so Section 401 provides a process by which states and tribes can review any proposed federal activity. So this could be something that the federal government is doing itself, or it could be something that the federal government is permitting. And on the right, I've um, set, uh, included a picture of a hydroelectric dam. So that's an example of, of uh, something that requires federal permits. Um, pipelines are another example. Um, so it's any federal activity, uh, that may result in any discharge into the navigable waters. And so what happens is you have this, you know, federal activity, whether it's being carried out by a private party or by the federal government, um, the state or the tribe will, re will review that activity um, for compliance with the Clean Water Act, uh, the state or tribe's water quality standards, and any state or tribal law pertaining to water quality, um, you know, that, that may be, uh, affected by this project or this activity. Um, so, you know, once they review that, they can say, you know, thumbs up, this is good. It's not going to, you know, interfere with our water quality. They can say, uh, thumbs up, this is good, as long as you do X, Y, and Z. And those X, Y, and Z are the, are become conditions to, if it's a permit, it, but they become conditions to the federal permit um, and they're enforceable. Um, or they can say, no, this is, you know, we don't want this. This is going to destroy our water quality. Um, this can't, this project can't go forward. So they can effectively nix a federal project um, based on based on their review. Um, so this is very um, controversial at the moment, similar to the Waters of the United States uh, rule. There, the Trump administration for the first time in, <clears throat> in 2020 uh, revised the regulations that implement the, the 401 program so that they were those regulations were actually <clears throat> on the books since I think 1971 so prior to the the more modern Clean Water Act 1972 so um, so now currently the EPA is proposing to uh, review that the uh, the Trump administration rule, or they're, they're rescind, proposing to rescind it and replace it with the new regulations. Um, the, the main concern is, you know, stakeholders concerned with environmental protection, they see 401 as a valuable tool to ensure that the um, states and tribes can broadly consider any federal activities impacts on water quality. Um, however, stakeholders that are subject to certification requirements, often, you know, the industries and entities seeking federal permits are concerned that there's going to be regulatory overreach by the states and tribes and that they, the state or tribe will veto a federally authorized project um, for inappropriate reasons that are, you know, not related to water quality or something like that. So that's the basic overview of the Clean Water Act and how it's structured, some of its major permit programs, things like that. Um, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Fantastic, Casey. Uh, that was uh, delightful. It felt like a real treat to have um, that kind of introduction and, and legal perspective, both on what the Clean Water Act covers, but also what some of those uh, more controversial more controversial areas are and what the current status is of that. So so, so really great presentation, uh, really appreciate that. Um, we do have um, a question um, from, uh, from our audience that, uh, that I think is particularly relevant and, and, and is probably somewhat challenging. Uh, Jeremy Coleman asked, um, how does the Clean Water Act apply to groundwater contamination and, and pollution? For instance, PFA, PFAs leaching into groundwater from old military bases. Uh, in, interesting question, uh, interesting challenge for the Clean Water Act, I think. Right, so groundwater is not a water of the United States, right? So it's not the type of um, water body that if you discharge into it, you're violating the Clean Water Act. However, there was a recent Supreme Court case um, called the city of Maui, um, where they actually uh, 
decided for the first time that if there's a direct enough, if let's say you're discharging into groundwater um, and then that seepage gets to a surface water that is jurisdictional, is a water of the United States. If that, if that connection is direct enough, uh, then the groundwater kind of becomes an extension of the point source that was discharging into the groundwater. So, so that's, that's a new aspect of the Clean Water Act. Um, but other than that, you know, I think the, I think, you know, because the Clean Water Act is so concerned with discharges to waters of the United States, um, obviously states can implement their own regulations um, for groundwater uh, that would possibly affect surface water. Um, it could be considered, you know, a non-point source. <clears throat> I think most of the time groundwater discharge is considered a non-point source discharge to surface water. Uh, so states can regulate it that way as well. Great. Yeah, no, that is helpful. And and it, it does speak to kind of how that's evolving even um, both with the Supreme Court decision. Um, uh, and with the, uh, the states wading into that. Another thing you mentioned um, was the rebuttable presumption. Um, I think you're saying with that, and, and, the, and the question we saw was um, that we can expect all waters to be fishable and swimmable in the U.S. So, so uh, the, the Clean Water Act is saying that um, that should be our baseline expectation, um, unless you, uh, you mentioned the um, the use attainability study, but generally speaking, um, through the Clean Water Act and all of these different programs, we should be able to um, uh, you know have a diverse fish and bug community in all of our streams, and we should be able to you know wade in and splash around in a stream or paddle in it or fish in it, um, and and that should be our standard. Is is that when when you talked about the rebuttable presumption and that legal term, is that what we're talking about? Yes, exactly. So the, you know, the the language in the section 101, the, the goals of the Clean Water Act, it does, um, you know, say where attainable. So that's where, you know, the, the, where attainable, this should be the goal. And so that's where that use attainability analysis uh, comes into play. Um, so yes, that is the goal of the Clean Water Act that all, all of the streams, you know, if possible, <laughs> um, should have that should have that uh, ability to be recreated in. You should be able to incidentally ingest the water without worrying about your health. Um, and there should be uh, a good environment for fish and wildlife. Yeah, yeah, really cool uh, uh, and, and, and powerful. That, that, that isn't uh, trivial. Um, <clears throat> another uh, question we have coming in um, from Emily uh, is what are the potential implications of the current Supreme Court case on that definition of wetland adjacency? Is that something that you're following um, and, 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 and what that means? Sure. So I, you know, this, this particular case, I did listen to a bit of the oral argument. Um, I think the, the main, you know, I'm, I'm not as deep into the legal issues um, as some folks are, but uh, I think the main implication or the big picture implication <clears throat> And what we see a lot of the time is is the political struggle between um, landowners and developers who who want to be able to you know make the highest and best use of their land, which often involves filling in wetlands, um, and then the ecological crisis that we have of you know losing acreage of wetlands every year, um, and and the you know, the seeming difficulty in identifying some wetlands, you know, just by sight, right? So, um, you know, one of the points that was argued a lot uh, that I was listening to was, you know, how are you supposed to know if you're violating the Clean Water Act? Like, how are you supposed to know that this is a water of the United States? It just looks like some some damp ground that we want to solve, you know, the 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 instability and the water issues, and we want to fill it in, and we want to build whatever. Um, and that's you know a lot, the rebuttal was well the jurisdictional determination. We'll get one of our people out there, and we'll look at it, and we'll you know determine if there's a significant nexus. We'll look at the chemical, physical, biological connections uh, with the traditional navigable water, 
And, you know, one of the other issues that they kept bringing up is like, okay, well, adjacency, how far is that? You know, is it one mile? Is it a hundred miles? Could it be five miles? And, you know, the, the attorney arguing for the federal government was like, I don't want to say that, you know, I don't want to say that there's a cutoff. Um, we need to get out there and look, and then it comes back to, well, then how's a regular per person supposed to know that they're going to violate the Clean Water Act? So that's kind of, um, you know, the difficulty. Uh, a lot of a lot of folks want regulatory clarity, um, but as those those of us who know about uh, water resources and the environment, it's not it's not cut and dry, right? There's a lot of ways that wetlands um, are connected to other water bodies, chemical, physically, biologically, um, and you know, in order to protect these these resources, there needs to be more nuance. Mm, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, we we getting into the complexity uh, and the nuance. That's great. All right. Well, um, we do have additional questions coming in, um, but I think in the interest of time, we we are actually a little bit over from our time slot. So I am going to um, thank Casey again. Fantastic introduction. 